In 1938, Britain built a locomotive so fast that chasing greatness nearly destroyed it. The Mallard was meant to win a global speed war, but at 126 miles per hour, its insides tore themselves apart. Why would the world's proudest engineers design a machine destined to self-destruct? The answer reveals the true cost of obsession and the thin line between victory and disaster. Headlines blared across continents, Britain and Germany race for the rails. In city squares and smoky taverns, crowds gathered around radios and newsstands, hungry for each new record. The 1930s were gripped by a fever for speed, not just in cars and airplanes, but on the steel arteries that stitched nations together. Railway posters promised a future measured in minutes, not hours. Maps of Europe and America glowed with ambition, each route a battleground for national pride. British Pathé newsreels captured the spectacle. Steam billowed above platforms packed with onlookers, while officials in top hats shook hands with engineers in oil-streaked overalls. Every departure was a performance, every arrival a chance for celebration or disappointment. The Mallard's streamlined silhouette became a symbol but it was only one contender. In Germany, the 05002 thundered across the plains, its speed trials filmed for eager cinema audiences. Across the Atlantic, the Pennsylvania Railroad unveiled the S1 at the World's Fair, its Art Deco shell gleaming under spotlights as crowds pressed against velvet ropes. Newspapers ran front-page stories on every attempt, tallying speeds and technical details like sports scores. Record runs turned into public events, with special trains packed with dignitaries and journalists. Children collected railway cards. Engineers became household names. In this climate, speed was more than a number. It was a statement of modernity, a promise that a nation could outpace its rivals. The world watched as the stakes grew higher and the machines themselves became both national heroes and sacrifices to progress. July 3, 1938. The Mallard thundered south from Grantham, pulling a dynamometer car and six coaches. At the controls, driver Joseph Duddington kept his hand steady on the regulator. Fireman Thomas Bray shoveled coal with a rhythm born of muscle and nerves. Stoke Bank's gradient fell away beneath the wheels, a rare stretch of track where speed could build with every yard. The regulator went wide open. Steam pressure surged, the dynamometer's needle swept past 100, then 110. Bray later recalled, everything went in, coal, steam, sweat. We could hear nothing above the roar. Milepost 90 and a quarter flashed by. The dynamometer sheet traced a single, spiked line, 126 miles per hour. For a handful of seconds, the Mallard became the fastest steam locomotive the world would ever know. Inside the frame, the center cylinder bearing began to overheat. A chemical warning charge burst, filling the cab with a sharp, acrid smell. Duddington glanced down. He knew what it meant. The speed fell away. At Essendine, he braked hard. The run limped on toward Peterborough. In the shed, mechanics crowded around the engine. The inspection photograph, now held in the National Railway Museum, shows the bearing. Blue, black, torn, ruined by heat. The record belonged to Mallard, but the price was clear. As Duddington put it, the engine was throbbing, the speed was exhilarating, and every part seemed to strain until the bearings gave way. Mallard had not exploded, had not derailed, but in that moment, it had torn itself apart from within, 126 miles per hour. Silence. Every part of the Mallard was engineered for speed, but at full throttle, the laws of motion wrote their own rules. Inside the frame, pistons raced back and forth, each stroke slamming with the force of a car crashing to the ground, five times every second. This wasn't just brute strength, it was rhythm, so precise that moving parts began to match the locomotive's natural frequency. When that happened, Vibration no longer canceled out. Instead, every shake reinforced the next, building in waves that swept through rods, bearings, and wheels. 
Engineers called this resonance. In that moment, a locomotive became less a machine and more an instrument, one that could play itself to pieces. On paper, the numbers looked manageable. In steel, amplification meant trouble. Bolts loosened, bearings heated, and metal flexed in ways no blueprint could predict. The result was invisible at first, then devastating. At the edge of speed, harmony turned to chaos. Inside every record-chasing locomotive, the bearings stood as the final guardians between motion and ruin. Each was lined with a silvery alloy, Babbitt metal, cast from 81 to 85% tin, hardened by antimony and copper. As speed climbed, so did temperature. At 65 degrees Celsius, the white metal was still solid, but every extra degree brought danger. Oil, thick as syrup at room temperature, thinned and slipped away under heat and pressure, leaving only a fragile film to separate steel from steel. Workshop manuals warned if the bearing shell crept above 65 degrees, risk multiplied, creep, fatigue, and soon after, true softening began. Above 100, the metal lost its strength within moments. A cross-section diagram reveals the narrow gap, just two-tenths of a millimeter, where oil must hold back disaster. Under the microscope, failed bearings show cracks, molten tin, and embedded debris, the signature of a system pushed past its limit. Inspectors in oil-stained coats knew the signs all too well. In 1939, the Pennsylvania Railroad S1 arrived at the New York World's Fair like a visiting titan, longer than a city bus, heavier than a destroyer's anchor, wrapped in polished steel and chrome. Its streamlined shell, shaped by Raymond Lowy, drew crowds by the thousands. Reporters called it the future of American speed, but behind the fanfare, crews gave it a different name, the Shaker. On test runs across the flat plains of the Midwest, engineers clung to their seats as the S1 thundered past 90, then 100 miles per hour. The cab vibrated so fiercely that tools danced on the floor, and gauges blurred in their housings. Crew memos from the Altoona shops tell of a locomotive that flexed with every surge of the pistons. The frame, nearly twice as long as anything before it, twisted and groaned under its own ambition. Connecting rods, each weighing more than a man, blurred into silver arcs as the driving wheels spun. At full speed, the S1's power was undeniable, but so was its instability. Vibration rattled bolts loose and sent tremors through the carriages behind. After a run on icy rails, the S1 derailed spectacularly, its size and force turning a slip into a spectacle. The World's Fair crowds saw a masterpiece the crews who wrote it saw the limits of engineering written in shaking steel. The S1 was retired after only a handful of years, its promise undone by the very forces it was built to conquer. In Germany, this, the 05002 was the pride of the Reichsbahn, a machine built as much for spectacle as for speed. In May 1936, it hurtled down the Berlin to Hamburg line clocking nearly 200 kilometers per hour, its red wheels a blur beneath the streamlined shell. Newsreels and posters showed the locomotive slicing through the countryside, a symbol of national prowess. But behind the headlines, the reality was more complicated. Propaganda films lingered on the speedometer, but avoided the workshop floor, where the true cost of velocity became clear. After each record attempt, Inspectors found the bearings dangerously overheated, the running gear worn far beyond normal limits. Maintenance logs recorded urgent repairs, bearings replaced, rods remachined, oil systems checked for signs of distress. Engineers noted that even the best German steel could not escape the punishment of such relentless speed. No catastrophic failures, but the demands of the trials left scars that cameras never showed. Official records confirm that after the fastest runs, 05002 was sidelined for immediate inspection. The connecting rods and bearing blocks needed attention before the locomotive could return to service. In public, the 05002 was a triumph. 
In the workshop, it was a warning. The limits of steam were not set by ambition or pride, but by the silent fatigue growing inside every bolt and bearing. On July 3, 1938, the Mallard reached 126 miles per hour, a speed still unmatched by any steam locomotive, as verified by National Railway Museum records and the original dynamometer sheets. This moment revealed both the brilliance and the vulnerability of 1930s engineering. Every nation that chased speed, from Britain to Germany and the United States, faced the same mechanical limits. Archival inspection photos and workshop logs confirm that after their fastest runs, these locomotives returned with ruined bearings and warped rods. Yet, not every detail is known. Some maintenance records remain missing, and the precise stresses inside every part were never fully measured. The shift to diesel and electric power in the 1950s marked the end of this era, but the lessons remain. Pushing technology to its edge exposes the final authority of physics and materials. Today, the preserved mallard stands as proof. Speed defined an age, but even the greatest machines could not outrun their own breaking point.